All right, thanks everybody. Hold on, let me get this microphone straightened out here. All right, there we go. Okay, my name is Nick Fish. I am the National Program Director for American Atheists, as Ian said, and um, is the slide presentation ready to go up on screen there? Um, I'm gonna be talking about one of the most critical fights that we're fighting right now um, at the national level. Um, if anyone was in the uh, sessions this morning, the member meeting or the local activism meeting, I talked a little bit about this, um, but this is the fight of our lives. This is the issue uh, that we are facing, that we are thankfully surrounded by a lot of great allies. Um, but the problem is that the other side has the levers of power right now. So we're gonna kick this off. Uh, we're gonna talk about the Johnson Amendment. Yes, can the liberties of a nation be secure when we have removed a conviction that these liberties are the gift of God? Among those freedoms is the right to worship according to our own beliefs. That is why I will get rid of and totally destroy the Johnson Amendment and allow our representatives of faith to speak freely and without fear of retribution. I will do that, remember. It was the great, it was the great Thomas Jefferson. Oh my God, stop talking, all right. All right, so this was at the National Prayer Breakfast back in February of 2017. Uh, Donald Trump, since he started out talking about running for president and when he was running for president, this is one of the few issues that if you actually looked at the things he proposed, this was one of the very few actual concrete policy proposals that he had during his campaign. This notion of I'm going to destroy the Johnson Amendment dates back to the early, not the earliest days of his campaign. You know, we started out with we're gonna build a wall and Mexico's gonna pay for it. But then as soon as things kind of pivoted into this uneasy alliance, um, or I guess some people would say this all too comfortable alliance between folks on the religious right and the Trump campaign, this has been a core message of Donald Trump's campaign. And so I, I think I need to start by just explaining what the Johnson Amendment is. Um, first of all, the Johnson Amendment uh, started in uh, 1954. Um, it is a provision in the tax code that just basically says, hey, if you're a 501c3, if we're giving you tax exempt status, if you're you know, kind of operating on the taxpayer dime and not c kicking in, you don't get to engage in electoral politics. Um, this includes churches, charities, nonprofit, uh, nonprofit organizations like American Atheists. We cannot, from this stage, say, hey, go vote for Donald Trump, or hey, go vote for J Gary Johnson, go vote for whomever. We can't do that. That would jeopardize our tax exempt status. We can't spend money telling you who to vote for. We can't spend money telling you who not to vote for. And this isn't just federal campaigns, by the way. This is campaigns at all levels of government. And that's why it's really important that we're, we're talking about this, because you know, at the national level, spending a million dollars, while it, you know, that's a lot of money, what if we're spending a million dollars in state house races? What if we're spending a million dollars for mayor? Like th those races, that's, that's more than is ever gonna be spent or has ever been spent in any of those races. That's why this is so important. Um, the, the actual text of it here um, is, is highlighted there in bold, and it just says that groups may not participate in, intervene in, including publishing or distributing, distributing of statements, any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for public office. Do you see anything in there about, about, that talks about issues? Do you see anything in there that says that you can't talk about abortion if you're an anti-choice group? Do you see anything in there that says that we can't talk about the Johnson Amendment, which is a matter of public concern, that is a piece of legislation? Look at, we're talking about it right here. So this notion that, uh, that this has anything to do with free speech is BS. The basic point of this is that tax deductible money shouldn't be used in elections and taxpayers shouldn't be forced to fund elections um, and, and fund groups for elections for people they disagree with. So what does this all mean? It means that churches and 501c3 groups can't spend their money on supporting or opposing candidates. That's it. It means that we can't endorse or oppose candidates in our official capacity as leaders of this organization. You, as the pastor of a church, can't endorse someone from the pulpit as the pastor of the church. It doesn't mean that you as the pastor of the church can't endorse a candidate. That's not what it means at all, okay? There is a distinction between those two things. 
On this stage, I am talking as a representative of American atheists. When I go down off this stage and I'm in my private life, I can endorse whoever I want. I can run for office if I want. There's nothing stopping pastors from running for office either. The key question here is what doesn't it mean? And it certainly doesn't mean that we can't speak out on issues that matter to you. It doesn't mean that churches can't speak out on abortion. It doesn't mean they can't speak out on uh, LGBT rights or same-sex marriage. As we know, they spoke out and they weren't shy about doing so. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't lobby members of Congress or the administration. We do this, we just have limits. We can't spend all of our money doing these things, but we can take an election that allows us to lobby, okay? It doesn't only apply to churches. It applies to, like I said, American atheists. It's not just faith leaders here. It applies to the ASPCA. It applies to the Red Cross. It applies to the Girl Scouts. It's not just churches who are, quote unquote, being targeted, as the president and others have said. This, is, this applies to anyone who gets a tax exemption, gets the tax write-off for donating to them. It also doesn't single out ministers. It's just, it's complete bunk to say that this is in any way an attack on faith leaders. So it also doesn't, and as I said, it doesn't prevent people from speaking out uh, in their individual capacity. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the key things here if you're talking about, um, if you're talking about free speech. Free speech doesn't apply um, to getting a, tax, uh, getting a tax exempt status. Free speech is what you do as an individual. Or, I don't know, we'll see what the Supreme Court says. <laughs> that might change. Um, sorry, wrong button. Um, so the Johnson is under attack here. The Johnson Amendment has been under siege for quite some time. Who exactly is pushing it though? Um, is, it's sort of, there are three groups right at the core of this. And these are three groups who, if you're a person who is concerned about church-state separation, if you're a person who's concerned about LGBT rights, if you're a person who, you know, isn't a jerk, these, these groups are terrible. Um, these groups are groups who make their living, make, spend all their time, basically, um, trying to discriminate against LGBT people, against taking rights away from women, against basically anything that's good and decent in this world, they oppose. And they oppose it as educational organizations. Um, Liberty Council is a um, sort of like the uh, religious nutbag version of the ACLU. Um, they go around, they're the people who defended Kim Davis. They're the who that was the Kentucky court clerk who said that her religious freedom meant that she could impose her views on same-sex couples because, uh, as an employee of the state, obviously. Um, and so these are the people, these, these groups, just, uh, just Alliance Defending Freedom by itself has a, an annual budget of about $50 million. I think it's $47 million, something in there. Um, the Family Research Council has been around for forever. Um, they have chapters in most states throughout the country. They've got a huge budget. Liberty Council, they have this network of hundreds and hundreds of attorneys who work for free, who are willing to work for free, work pro bono, and willing to spend a bunch of time trying to create loopholes the size of you know, a truck um, to just destroy every civil rights, a piece of civil rights legislation we have. So what exactly are they doing in pursuit of this goal? Number one is the Pulpit Freedom Sunday, which is just a hell of a name for a thing. Um, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, um, this Johnson Amendment has been in place since 1954. Um, all right, in 2008, we're gonna take back our freedom by telling pastors to break the law, break IRS regulations, record themselves uh, talking about politics or politicking, and I gotta be careful here because talking about politics is not against the rules. Electioneering is against the rules. So they say, record yourself breaking the rule and send it to the IRS and dare them to do anything about it. And they've been doing this since 2008 and does anyone want to take a guess at the number of churches who have lost their tax-exempt status as a result of this? Hey, you guys are like really, really smart. <laughs> Zero of the churches who participate in Religious Freedom Sunday, or Pulpit Freedom Sunday, lost their tax-exempt status. This is a, this whole Johnson Amendment repeal thing is a solution, and I'm gonna use scare quotes there, in search of a problem. There are, there is zero persecution of Christian ministers, and let's be clear here, this is Christian ministers we're talking about. There is zero persecution of Christian ministers in this country. They are allowed to speak out, and what they're doing is something much more nefarious. Um, 
This is a direct quote from Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, of the participating pastors, 1,517 preached sermons presenting biblical perspectives on the positions of electoral candidates. Think about that. They, they talked about the positions of candidates as they relate to the Bible. What they didn't do, or that, what this doesn't say is, and endorsed the candidate from the pulpit. You are allowed to talk about the positions of candidates. Churches, <laughs> I am allowed to get up on this stage and say, Donald Trump has been no friend to atheist issues. Donald Trump supports additional exemptions to civil rights laws, religious exemptions. Donald Trump supports so on and so forth. I am allowed to say that. There is nothing against the law. There's nothing jeopardizing Amer uh, American atheists 501c3 status by me saying that. You know why? Because it's not electioneering. That is not politicking from the pulpit. That's just talking about issues of concern, which is allowed under the tax code. So again, it bears repeating. What they just said has nothing to do with what the Johnson Amendment actually prohibits. So I, I always, I'm, I'm never quite clear if they just have no idea what they're talking about or they proactively lie out their ass constantly. My intuition is the latter, but I don't know. So the next question, what's actually at stake with this? Churches already get special treatment under the law, right? If you were at the members meeting this morning, David mentioned that American Atheist puts our IRS Form 990s on the web so you can download them at any time. You can check and see the financial health of this organization. We go a step further, we get our books audited every year and we put that online. Do church, are churches required to submit their Form 90s for public inspection? No. Are they required to post audits? No. What is the big reason that we're required to put up a Form 990? Because we get a benefit from the government and you get a benefit from the government for donating to us. Donations are tax deductible, americanatheist.org. Um, so, <laughs> atheist.org slash donate, check it out. Um, so, you get a benefit. You are getting something from the government, we are getting something from the government, and what the government is saying is, okay, as part of this deal, where we're agreeing to give you tax-exempt status, you're agreeing to be transparent, you're agreeing to be neutral, and you're agreeing to do good in the community, right? So, churches are, at maybe two of those things, right? They, so they have soup kitchens, they you know, house, the, house the homeless, feed the hungry, like that, that's good. Um, they mostly, they're, they're supposed to stay neutral, but they already get an exemption from that first one of being transparent. Now, they want an exemption from another pillar of this. And by the way, while you're supposed to do good, like that's the whole thing about being a nonprofit, if you're a church, you don't have to show that you do good. All you have to do is say, hey, I'm a church. And that's it. And you get a tax exempt status. So the whole reason that this tax exempt status exists, number one is to support charity and support education. The other one, and this is, this, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, more about this in a moment. The other thing is we support separation of church and state. That means on some level, even as atheists, we don't, I don't, we support religious freedom. We support the right of churches to believe whatever silly thing they want to believe. That's your right as an American. And it's not the government's job to tell you what you can and can't believe. And so what we have to do is look at this and say, okay, why are churches getting this special treatment? Well, it's to minimize entanglement. Okay, whatever. But they still have to play by most of the rules, allegedly. But they're not. This action here isn't about freedom, it's about giving more power to churches. There's a piece of legislation that I'll talk about in a second here that is wending its way through Congress. It's probably not gonna go anywhere, that's why we're not too concerned about it. But what this piece of legislation does is it gets rid of the Johnson Amendment as it applies to churches, nonprofits, whomever. You know, they sent the, the other side sent a letter saying, oh, this helps everyone, including nonprofits. It's too bad most of the nonprofit world doesn't want this. But they're, they're idiots, you know, they, they, they don't know what's good for them. They, they need more freedom, we're gonna give them more freedom. This bill isn't going anywhere. 
What is going through Congress right now is a rider, uh, a rider attached to an appropriations bill. And this, I, I see people in the back nodding off already, which is fine, I apologize. Um, appropriations bill says how the government can spend its money. A rider attached to the bill says, you can't spend any money appropriated in this bill on enforcing the Johnson Amendment as it relates to churches. That's the language in the bill, as it relates to churches. Doesn't say mosques, doesn't say temples, it doesn't say meeting halls, it doesn't say gatherings, it doesn't say nonprofit organizations. It specifically says churches. Okay? Now church has a legal definition that does include, you know, mosques and whatnot, but it's only for churches. So this isn't about equality. The fact that these people have the temerity to say, oh, it's it's about equality. No, it's not. This is about solidifying their position, their dominance that they once had in American politics and reinforcing that and keeping it and getting as much power as they can for themselves. So we gotta call them on it. They do not want accountability, they do not want any transparency, and they want no limits on their activities. There is nothing to stop a church from engaging in this sort of behavior of endorsing candidates, of spending unlimited amounts of money that's coming from who knows where because they don't have to publish that. There's nothing stopping them. If you are a person who is not a fan of Citizens United, then this is Citizens United times 100. This is worse. Citizens United ostensibly says that the government can require uh, transparency. So yeah, you can spend your money through a super PAC, but you have to disclose where it's coming from, and there are ways around that, but we can you know, pass another law and then you can get it in there. What this would do is mean absolutely zero transparency because these people don't want the government poking around in churches. And that's not, by the way, just for politics. That's because I think we know the reason why. Um, they, they don't, we don't, do we want the government combing through financial records of churches to see where they're spending their money? Do you want the government, you know, if you, if you were a member of a humanist group, do you want the government going in and saying, well, this is a legitimate purpose, this is not a legitimate purpose, this is and this isn't? We don't. I don't, we, that is not religious freedom. That's, that's huge government intrusion into religion. And again, even as atheists, we don't want the government getting in and telling people what their religion should and shouldn't believe. So they have seen their power erode over the last few years, and they are doing everything they can. They are doing everything in their power to hold on to it. So what's gonna happen if this thing passes? As I just said, unlimited secret money funneled through every church in America. There are countless super PACs already in this country, and I talked about this a minute ago. But if you are, we're not talking about just federal elections here. We're not talking about um, you know, the Koch brothers or George Soros, pick your left or right wing boogeyman. Um, we're not talking about them donating a billion dollars to some church. What we're talking about is some anonymous person donating $100,000 to a church and saying, here, I, I wanna give you this money for your soup kitchen, but make sure that you're telling your, your congregants every Sunday to vote for this candidate. And we would have no way of knowing that that happened. And that guy, by the way, would get a tax deduction coming out of your pockets to re reduce his taxes. The other thing that I think needs to be said, and this is why the title of my talk is Unlikely Allies. This is something that the churches don't like. This is something that the church community, the religious community doesn't want right here. Politicians using elections to coerce churches and nonprofits for endorsements. So if you're a slightly corrupt politician or just a politician who would love to hang on to power and you can walk up to the church and say, hey, um, it's a nice tax exempt status you have there. <laughs> Be a shame if something were to happen to it. Um, but not just a church. We're talking about the local animal shelter. We're talking about the local Boy Scout troop. We're talking about every single nonprofit organization in your community. We're talking about tri-state freethinkers. We're talking about atheists of Utah. And suddenly it's an arms race. It's every nonprofit outrunning each other to endorse these candidates and giving up their neutrality, giving up their core mission in order to buy off, in a way, 
or solicit the support of a politician. Right now, you've got the perfect excuse if a politician wants, wants your endorsement. Sorry, can't do that because it's, it's against the law. I'd lose our tax income status. If this, go, if this goes away, there's nothing stopping that. And then if you choose to remain neutral, why would a politician want to support your group? Why would a politician want to give grants and money from the, the treasury to your group when he could give it to the similar group that endorsed him in the last election? So this is why churches are on our side on this because they want to stay neutral. They don't want their congregations divided along these lines. Politics is divisive enough already. Do you want your atheist group divided up among those who supported you know, uh, Bob Smith in the last local election or you know, uh, Jim, uh, me, Nick Fish, you voted for me, thank you so much. Do you, do you want that division in your group, tearing your group apart, m dividing up your support? No. So how are they going about attacking the Johnson Amendment? Number one, I just mentioned the, the standalone piece of legislation, the Speech Fairness Act. I, you know, whoever names these things, this is just the most like duplicitous, talking out of both sides of your mouth thing. It's like Alliance Defending Freedom. I mean, come on. Um, Free Speech Fairness Act, this is the one that says churches and nonprofits don't have to follow the Johnson Amendment. We think this is a bad idea, but at least it's equal, right? Like this is a terrible idea, but at least it encompasses everyone. Next one, riders and amendments to appropriations bills. This is the dangerous one. I'm gonna talk, I talked a little bit about this earlier. I'll talk more about it in a second. Next one, tax reform. Uh, Donald Trump um, and members of the House and Senate leadership have talked a lot about pushing through tax reform. They we're a little unclear on what that means, um, but this is a potential vehicle for uh, where we could see a, the Johnson Amendment being attacked. Second, potential legal challenges to the Johnson Amendment. So this goes back to a lot of the Supreme Court cases that have been decided over the last few years. Um, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, uh, so I know a lot of folks are familiar with what this is, um, basically says that the government has to use the least restrictive means possible to accomplish an outcome um, if it, it burdens someone's religious freedom. And you can say, uh, yeah, filling out this tax form or not being able to talk politics really burdens my religious freedom. Right? That's, that's not a hard argument to make. But that's, that's something that's possible. We haven't seen too much of that yet on the Johnson Amendment because they're pursuing all these other avenues first. Um, second one, President Trump's executive order um, that he signed in the Rose Garden along with a bunch of evangelical leaders, um, including people who endorsed him, by the way. Um, so, again, <laughs> the idea that candidates or that uh, pastors aren't able to endorse is false because they do all the time and they usually stand next to Donald Trump while he's saying that pastors can't endorse, but whatever. So, but this executive order, um, we're gonna start on this. Number one, it doesn't do a whole lot. It was kind of a uh, you know, visibility thing. Um, it just, it, it says sticking within the law, we want to do everything we can to make sure this doesn't impact people too much. It's kind of a nothing sandwich. Um, the ACLU said they weren't gonna follow, file suit. FFRF did, but that's because they had a settlement um, so it's a little complicated, but um, we don't really think this is gonna do a whole lot. Second one, um, we don't see that standalone bill going anywhere in the Senate. We have more than enough people who oppose it in the Senate that it, it wouldn't get through. Tax reform is gonna be a giant mess um, because every single interest group has the thing that they want. Uh, there are, there's just tons of stuff going on there. Um, I, that one's kinda up in the air, but we don't really see it moving very fa far there. Legal challenges, who the hell knows? Uh, this is a, just, a, again, a giant mess. Um, but Neil Gorsuch on the Supreme Court, lots of circuit court judges and district judges coming up, so it may be less of a mess later. Riders and amendments, this has already happened. This is the appropriations bill that I mentioned. This is the financial services and government, uh, general government appropriations bill. Again, I see more nodding off. Um, this passed through a subcommittee, went through a committee, and in the, in the full committee, we actually got an amendment introduced um, that only failed by, I think it was three votes. Um, and we had two Republicans cross the aisle to vote with the Democrats who had opposed uh, this, this uh, rider being attached. So there is room there. There's a, there are people who um, you know, support the, the, the transparency and support the Johnson Amendment on both sides of the aisle. That's why we have to work um, 
in coalition. So on our side, we've got 4,500 nonprofit organizations ranging from the Girl Scouts and the Red Cross uh, to Catholic Charities USA and the Baptist Joint Committee. We've got denominations. We've got the, the Episcopal Church, uh, the American Baptist Churches, Evangelical Lutheran Church, uh, is, Islamic groups, um, um, the, the Unitarians, the Buddhists, the Hindus. Um, it's it's 99, 99 different faith groups signed on opposing any changes here. The American people are on our side. 72% of Americans oppose changing the Johnson Amendment. Uh, that was a survey by independent sector. Public Religion Research Institute's numbers match that, 71%. Uh, the numbers you can see there, it's very small, I apologize. Even every religious group doesn't want this, but especially unaffiliated. Nice work, guys. Um, so how are we fighting back? We gotta call members of Congress. You got, we, we need to be engaged on this. This is, um, I have a slide here. The, the media is not talking about this. Uh, everyone's talking about every other crazy thing that's happening and has happened over the last few months. But this is a potential cataclysm. We are fighting for this. The, 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 the huge coalition of groups are on our side. Um, I, I mentioned um, <laughs> that we had uh, 4,500 nonprofit groups sign on uh, in opposition to repealing the Johnson Amendment. The other side put together this sign-on letter and they had, um, I believe it was, it was 47 groups that, opposed, that supported repealing the Johnson Amendment. We actually had more pages listing coalition partners than they had groups signed on to this thing. And by the way, half of their groups were just chapters of the American Family Association. So different state chapters. So they've only got like three, those three main groups I mentioned and something called like Eagle Forum and the, uh, the, the Concerned Women of America. So some really you know, heavy hitting groups there. Um, call your member of Congress. We have resources on our website. We're gonna have more resources. We will send them to you via email. Make sure you're signed up um, for email action alerts. Call your member of Congress. Do it every day. This, is, this, is a, this takes five minutes, maybe, where you can call and say, hey, this is an issue that matters to me. I'm an atheist. Don't vote for this. Don't vote for this thing that's being rammed through without any public hearings, without any public debate. It's snuck in as a rider to an appropriations bill. They can't pass it as a standalone bill because it's so unpopular. Meet them in their offices. Build those relationships. Talk to your members of Congress. Talk to their staffs. Get to know who is handling this. this. Our friends at the Secular Coalition had a fantastic lobby day where we talked about this. They have fantastic resources. They are best equipped um, to give you the resources on lobbying specifically uh, because they are a 501c4 organization, which is great. Um, but thank, and then thank your members for doing the right thing. This is you know carrot and stick approach. If they're doing the, if they're doing the wrong thing, call them out. If they're doing the right thing, we gotta thank them. Next, I'm almost done here. Work in coalitions. This is critical for what we're doing here. Church leaders are largely on our side. There was a survey of, of uh, evangelical leaders. 90% of evangelical pastors support protecting the Johnson Amendment because they realize how important it is to, for churches to stay neutral. This is one of those times where a religious leader's voice in this debate might carry more weight than the atheist, right? Because if they're allowed, to, if the other side can frame this as, oh, the angry atheists are attacking us again, right? That's a framing that works well for them. They, they like playing the victim. But if, you, if we can draft a letter, and we've done this, if you draft a letter saying the Johnson Amendment is very important, it protects neutrality, it keeps the government out of religion, it keeps religion out of government, it's, it promotes fairness, so on and so forth, and you can get, you can sign it, but you get a religious leader to sign on it with you, or you have them submit it as an op-ed. This is what we do in coalitions all the time. This is, why, this is how you enact change and find a good framing for your issue. Because the, you know, atheists oppose allowing church to politic. Well, no shit, right? Churches oppose allowing churches to politic. That's a story. You gotta think about how the media is gonna, is gonna follow this. You know, if it's atheists saying it, it's man bites, or it's dog bites man. If it's the other way around, it's man bites dog, and that, that's a story, all right? Um, think outside the box. Find coalition partners who, you know, maybe people, you know, wouldn't have thought of. Again, we have the Girl Scouts. Everybody loves the Girl Scouts, right? Cookies, delicious. So that's, that's why it's important for us to, to, to reach out 
be, be visible in your community, be outspoken as an atheist, but be willing to work with people who you don't agree with 100% of the time. There are times to lead and times to step back. This one requires both. That it requires us. This is like our thing, right? We have been talking about this for how long? And it finally springs onto the, out into the public, into, the, into the, the, the debate. And we're ready. And what do we do now that we're ready and willing for this fight? We take a step back and let the church's hand do it. Like we're, we're doing the groundwork, we're doing the legwork, but we're letting churches put their name on it. And that's fine because we care about doing good. I don't care at all about getting Nick Fish's name in the paper for protecting the Johnson Amendment. I care about protecting the Johnson Amendment. American Atheists does care about getting its name in the paper. That's fine. American Atheists doesn't care about American Atheists protects the Johnson Amendment. What we care about is protecting the Johnson Amendment. And like I said, the media is not covering this at all, but it, it is a threat to our democracy. I can't be more blunt than that. We have to raise the awareness of this issue. This is the fight of the next year. And I just want to close with this number. 72%, and I'll say it again, 72% of Americans are on our side. This isn't some fringe issue. This isn't about how many people identify as atheists. This is about a supermajority of the American people not wanting their government and their churches and their nonprofit organizations and their charities corrupted by big money and politics. And that's the fight. Thank you.